Hello, hello, hello. We are st oh, here's Boaz. Hello, Boaz. Great to see you. Hey, this. Thing Howdy, Jasmine. Thanks for having me. <laughs> oh, it's marvelous, isn't it? Nice to see you, Boaz. And um, Gary's joining us as well in a moment. He he watched the trailer apparently, so that's really good. Um, so we are live. We are actually live on Instagram. Yep. Really good fun. I'm Jasmine Bertles. I run MoneyMagpie.com, and I am currently joined by Boaz Shoshan. Boaz is from South Bank Investments and does all sorts of things. Boaz, tell us what you do. Yeah, I wear a few different hats these days. Uh, I do do some work for South Bank Investment Research with uh, South Bank Live, which is our, our live YouTube stream. But in terms of what I do most of the time these days is actually uh, in the crypto space. So I've, uh, after many years in the traditional financial world, I've finally broken bad and gone to the crypto, the, the crypto dark side, as it were. Uh, so, yeah, I work with a decentralized exchange called Orca. Uh, this is in the Solana blockchain, and it's called orca.so. Anyone wants to check it out. Great. Now, um, Gary has joined, but um, you're you're there, but we, I can't see you, Gary. See, I've done this, but when I've joined a, a, an Instagram Live, it happened with me. I was going, I'm here, I'm here, but couldn't be seen. So, Gary, I don't know quite what to do, actually, to bring you in. Um, you may have... You may have to click something else. I don't know. Um, okay, I'm waving at Jay. Ash. Hello, Jay. Good to see you. And um, Rob, good to see you. We've got a few other people. So, Gary, if um, I don't know what you have to do to join, but um, I can see that you are on the list. I just can't actually see you. So if you could, um, I don't know, maybe go, go out and come back in again. I, I'm not sure. Um, I will do another invite to you um, Gary, um, I've sent an invite again, so maybe that'll work. Lovely technology. Don't you love it, eh? I'm <laughs> sorry. Oh, there you are. Fantastic. Excellent. It worked. It worked. <laughs> I like it. So Our it's, technology. Isn't it? Yeah. Just fabulous. Gary, tell us more about you. Say, because uh, we've heard about Shoshan and um, all the, the crypt his, his crypto credentials, as it were. Tell us about what you do, Gary. Yep, so I, I get involved in a number of things. I've been interested in blockchain, which is the technology behind crypto, since about 2014, 2015. Turned that into a career of doing education, consultancy, and advisory services since then. Got into the crypto space about 2016, 2017 which most of the time I didn't really understand it, and probably a lot of people are going through this right now, yeah. where you're hearing about crypto wallets and keys and all, all this kind of stuff. So I started reading about it, learned about it, and set up my own crypto club, which yeah, people cool. are free to join if they Google Books Crypto Club. Now, Books actually sounds for Buckinghamshire. Nowadays, yeah. it's money. Yeah. But yeah, just go, just Google Books Crypto Club, people can come and join. And I actually set up a social network from that of people to learn, share, and contribute news and ideas. Okay. So nowadays, I do consultancy advisory services, mm -hmm. working on some fascinating projects, uh, some of which are NFT-based, some of which are about uh, digital asset custody. Yeah. So uh, as crypto comes into the mainstream, we need to work out how to secure it safely. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and with cash, you know, money, we do that with banks. It doesn't work that way in crypto. So I'm, I'm helping a few companies with that. Really interesting. See, uh, you're, you're both, we, could t we could talk all day, actually, in all honesty, about what you two are doing, because you're both working on new stuff, new crypto, new NFT, as you say. Um, you know, I mean, the, we could literally talk all day just explaining and talking about the, the pros and cons of NFTs and different types of crypto. But... We're just going to do this for 30, 40 minutes. Um, so the point of, of this live, as you know, is to, to help people not lose money or not lose more money than they have to, if you like, through crypto and NFT. It's all very volatile. It's all very new. Uh, you know, I'm always saying to people, if you're going to invest in it, make sure that you put money in that you could afford to lose. But it's still not fun losing money. So, um, Boaz, I'll start start with you. Um, let's talk about NFTs because this is something that's it's all over the social media. Can you explain what an NFT is and how you could potentially make and certainly lose money with it? Yeah, well, that's a very good question indeed. In terms of defining what an NFT is, broadly these days they're referred to as sort of digital collectibles. 
but that what they what they can do it goes a lot further than that. Uh, an NFT, a non fungible token, it's called a non fungible token because one NFT is not the same as another NFT. Unlike something like Bitcoin, where one Bitcoin can be valued and exchanged uh, for another Bitcoin, they have the same value. NFTs, however, because each one is unique, or generally speaking, they're unique. Uh, they aren't fungible in that manner because they, they have that unique quality. So NFTs in general, the NFT market is actually, well, NFTs in general have been around for a long time. So uh, this is not something that's widely widely appreciated, I don't think. But I mean, NFTs existed back in 2014. I think the first one was with the Dash blockchain. You don't hear much about Dash anymore, or uh, but the, the, the concept of creating a unique token in that manner has existed for a long time. It's only over the past, uh, really, in 2021. There was a big market in 2020 as well. Uh, but I think the total amount of uh, total value that's been put into NFT smart contracts in 2021 was over $40 billion, whereas in 2020, I think it was only $300 million. Um, so the, but, you know, in 2017, the last major, major crypto boom before we got lockdowns and everything, um, there was still a lot of NFT activity, and that was when CryptoPunks, which are now viewed as the blue chip NFT, uh, really started getting going. I remember CryptoKitties was a very big thing. Yeah. I was less interested in NFTs back in 2017, only more recently uh, taken an interest in it. I'm not what you'd say an expert, but uh, through my, my work with Orca, the, uh, the decentralized exchange, we did actually launch an NFT project for uh, you know power users, people who are very, very interested in what we do and really fans of the uh, of the uh, the platform that we have and so we did one called Orkanauts. so the, in this uh, just to sort of uh, qualify what this was uh, if you bought an Orkanaut nft you would send a bit of sol to a, a smart contract some solana and in return you would be able to mint a unique uh, whale themed sort of profile picture image uh, each one being different and uh, of the the rewards that you got for that you know you've got the nft of course you've got the token Ultimately, we wanted to make more util, you know, give some a bit more utility for that. So, as we are a decentralized exchange, if you do own an Orkanaut, that means you get access to a special channel on our Discord, which allows uh, them to, uh, you know, members of the Orkanaut school community, as it were, to interact much more directly with the people who actually uh, run the exchange. So, the the co-founders and the engineers who uh, who make you know uh, our our decentralized exchange so good. Uh, but ultimately, when you look, think of NFTs and you're trying to, you know, trying to, you know, how can I make money or how can I avoid money? You should always start with, well, you need to know what it is that you're buying and you need to really understand what the value proposition for that is. So uh, if there is some kind of utility to it, then uh, that, you know, that adds a bit more value. But then at the same time, we, this, we could launch into another, another discussion entirely where uh, if an NFT does have a lot of utility added to it, then the financial regulator might start to think of it as a security. But that's a completely different discussion, so we'll put that to one side. As with anything, with investing, you should definitely know what you are doing before you are you know, are risking any money on it. Crypto and NFT have been uh, volatile since day one. Uh, well, if you go way before there was even a market for it, okay, maybe Bitcoin wasn't volatile because you couldn't actually see a price. But you know, ever since there was a price for Bitcoin, it has been as volatile as ever. This is the Wild West. You know, as I say, if you were ever to go into this market, if it were a physical market like the days of old, you would want to be carrying a gun because there's lots of actors out there. But, you know, there's great treasure, great riches out there. So if yeah. you do want to, you don't want to risk it, then by all means, but know what you're doing. Yes. Uh, Gary, you, you've said many times before that this is the Wild West. And, um, and yeah, going, going in with a digital gun would be good. And uh, we're talking about scams and and the number of people who are are losing money mostly i would say through social media nft and crypto scams um what what kind of scams have you been seeing and and what advice do you have to people particularly on social media so so for me i'd offer a couple of things really there's, there's several ways of losing money in crypto and, and nfts uh, one is through making mistakes Mm -hmm. which is where you actually have to learn what you're doing because you can get things long, wrong. And there are big companies who've lost millions of dollars through what are known as fat finger mistakes. They simply uh, keyed an entry wrongly mm -hmm. on, on a keyboard, press transmit. There's no way to get it back when it goes wrong. So that's quite a scary thing. Um, then you've got the natural volatility. Uh, as we say, you know, Bitcoin went up 5% today. 
you know, and that's not unusual. And it will drop down by 5% and, and everything else. So it's kind of funny when you look at people who are in the traditional finance markets who are saying, oh, Bitcoin's collapsed. It's gone down by 15%. No, nah, that's, that's just normal. Don't, don't, don't panic. Everything's okay type thing. So you, you've got the volatility of something to watch. In terms of scams and that, um, there, there's a mixture of things. There are people who are doing things um, who are introducing new technologies, you know, they've launched an NFT or whatever, but they're not actually technically very good themselves. Mm. So they may have made a mistake in the smart contract, which is, after all, a computer program. Um, and it's either an inadvertent mistake and it all goes wrong, or it allows an exploit, as it's happened a couple of days where someone ex exploited, I think, several hundred dollars, uh, several hundred million dollars through a wormhole. So you, you get those kind of things going on as well. And then there are the absolute out-and-out -out scams. The, the red flags for me is the obvious one. We've, we've said this in the traditional finance world. If it looks too good to be true, it is. Yeah. Crypto is no different. You know, I, I joined a group a couple of days ago um, because I, I just thought it was really interesting. It's backed by somebody in the UK who is considered a very credible person in the medical field. And he's doing a lot of stuff in, a, in, a, in another area. And so I thought, I'll ju just join this and see, see what's going on. And as soon as they talk about they guarantee 300% profit in, <laughs> six, in 600 days uh, and that they guarantee a return of half a percent a day, mm -hmm. you know, the old Financial Services Agency, which is now the FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority, always had little things, you know, um, Past performance is no future guarantee of future price, blah, 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 blah. But that holds true with anything. Yeah. So the, the, the really big red flag straight away is anyone guaranteeing profits. Okay, so I, I normally come with a caveat above here that says I'm not offering financial taxation or legal advice. Yeah. I have to offer that as advice. If it looks too good to be true, it probably is. Yeah. Um, so be wary of that. Uh, if you are going to do some research and all you find is bad news about people who are involved in it, mm -hmm. there's probably a reason for that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and people are arguing now, oh, yeah, well, that's just because people are putting out bad news about them. No, if they've been scammers and they've scammed, it's a scam. Yeah. So I, I, I just offer the caution on that. But the, the obvious one really is if it sounds too good to be true, it will be. Yes, absolutely. I've got a question here from Everything Isabel, who says, um, what is the safest platform to use to invest in crypto? Um, Gary, you, I know you, you use a few platforms. Which ones do you suggest? So, so safety, uh, as in anything in life, is relative. Mm -hmm. Not Nothing that we do in the world, whether it's finance, medicine, anything is 100% safe. It always carries risks in some way. The reliable platforms are typically the well-known ones. So the likes of Coinbase, um, which has got a good reputation. Uh, its hot wallets, I think, are actually insured. Uh, so it's, it's got a good, good reputation if things go wrong. That's crazy. Binance is the most traded platform in, in the world. It's a centralized exchange, so it goes against uh, the principle of decentralized exchanges. But Binance you know, is used worldwide by people. Mm. Occasionally that goes wrong. Mm. No, I mean, and in fact, I, I actually know when there's a big price movement going on in the crypto world, not because I get an alert to say that price has moved, but because I start getting WhatsApp messages from my friends or on Telegram saying Binance won't let me in anymore or it's locked up or something. And, and that happens with all of the exchanges. But certainly the, the likes of Binance cracking these days is a, a pretty reasonable exchange. Mm -hmm. um, Blockchain.com, there are, there are various ones. Yeah, but nothing is one hundred percent safe. Well, quite, and um, but I, I do think it's a really good question, Isabel, because there are most definitely some criminal platforms out there, and I say that because I personally have been affected by one of them because I've got a company, um, Blockchain, Block 
train um, and uh, limited. And that was actually the name and uh, the, the company number was taken on by some criminals in, I think, South America. And I had no idea about this. They set up dot blockchain dot something or other um, until I got some um, emails from somebody in India going, can I have my money back, please? Um, and it turns out they put my name, they put the cr company number, all of that pretending to be me. I managed to get them taken down, took 24 hours, but it gives you an idea of this is happening all the time. So, you know, I mean, I agree with Gary, th those ones he mentioned, although Binance, um, the FCA has got a problem with that. So it could be difficult to actually put money into that if you're in the UK. Um, but, but Binance, Binance only has a problem with the FCA in terms of uh, derivative contracts, but in terms of normal trading, that, that that's not affected. But well, you're right that that does mean that sometimes some of the banks might have a bit of trouble with it. The other point as well, Jasmine, in terms of red flags, you, you made a really good point there, actually. Uh, celebrity endorsements. Oh, yes. Celebrity endorsements on social media, nine times out of ten are fake. Yes. So if you see these ones of, oh, this was endorsed by Dragon's Den people who couldn't believe how good it was, or, you know, this was Alan Sugar's, you know, Apprentice of the Year, blah, blah, blah. Most of them are fake. Yeah. They are. The, the only real social media thing you do tend to see is Elon Musk tweeting things. Mm. And if Elon sends you a tweet to say, send me your Bitcoin and I'll double it, <laughs> even that's fake. Absolutely. Yes, I, I've, I've had that. I've had a tweet going, Elon Musk says, yeah, yeah right, yeah, yeah. Boaz, are, do you, have you seen any um, particular uh, scams that, that you thought were actually funny or, or actually, you know, the sort of thing you really need to look out for? Uh, well, there are, there are certainly loads of funny ones out there. Uh, and, you know, you don't, it's, it's bad to, uh, it, you know, you feel bad uh, laughing at somebody else's expense. But, you know, uh, going back to what we were talking about, where you need to know what you're doing, right, when they're using NFTs. If you're in the crypto space, you need to understand what private keys are. You need to understand what seed phrases are and how important that is. So uh, the private keys are, you can think of it a bit as a, as a password uh, to or crypto in general. And that can be uh, cryptocurrencies, can be crypto assets. And you should never, ever, ever let somebody else uh, you know, take a look at it uh, unless you are giving it away, really. Mm -hmm. As the thing goes, not your keys, uh, not your keys or not your keys, not your coins. You should never let somebody else do, uh, take a look at either the private key or the seed for it. Now, in the NFT space, because there's so much hype around this on social media, as we've been discussing, you get a lot of people who uh, get into it very excited but don't understand a lot of the basics. Mm -hmm. They get lured in by other people, say, on Discord or on Twitter or whatever, saying, hey, uh, I really like this uh, Bronze Age Yacht Club 8 that you've got that you've spent six figures on, right? I can, I can put a really nice hat on it. You just need to your seed phrase, uh, and then I'll send it back to you uh, with this hat on it, right? Okay. And, you know, so people have done this, and they've just given away their seed phrase. They, they've given away the private key, and they've lost vast, you know, they've spent huge amounts of money on these JPEG apes. And, uh, you know, it's funny, but it is also very tragic, as okay. people have lost a lot of money through it. Uh, but that's the NFT space. Uh, as I say, this is why it's the Wild West. There are lots of bad actors out there, so you need to be very, very careful with it. Uh, in the crypto space more broadly, there was, of course, the, the classic BitConnect scam back from 2017. It was um, uh, theatrical. It was, uh, uh, it was incredibly hilarious. And even before it was revealed to be a scam, if you, if you couldn't tell that that was a scam and it was a Ponzi, uh, you know, you really shouldn't have been playing in space. This is where Carlos Matos, a very exuberant uh, New Yorker, I believe, uh, attending a conference where he yells the word BitConnect for extended periods of time and goes on very strange rants about how much money he's making in BitConnect. That's yeah. why he loves BitConnect, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this was, and it, so I think managed to get $400, $500 per, per coin for BCC, uh, and it went to zero. Uh, it was a massive scam. Tens of millions of dollars were lost, and lots of people got lured into it, uh, but it created a lot of meme material because it was such a theatrical, crazy thing. Uh, that would be that would be probably the... The biggest example I can think of of, uh, of a crypto scam going wrong. Yeah. But ultimately, you know, there's lots of uh, you know, rug pulls and there are uh, hacks going on loads of the time. It's scams is where, you know, there are bad actors that are trying to sell you something rather than trying to steal something from you. Mm, right. I'm also thinking, as you were talking, I'm thinking of Dogecoin. I mean, 
you know, that, that's one that Elon Musk and his, his friends have really hyped up. You don't hear about Dogecoin now, but it, it, it ended up on, on the platforms, you know, I mean, built based on nothing, it seemed to me. What's, what's happened to Dogecoin, Gary? Do you know? It, it seems to have gone down. It's like anything else in the, in the crypto world. The crypto world is like the normal world. You know, as we say, there are scams. It's just everything happens 10 times faster, if not more so. And so you get these peaks, these crazes and everything that appear and disappear. So, you know, you had Doge, you had Shiba Inu, you had the various other doggy type coins. This kind of, they seem to have faded away for now as everyone's getting back into apes at the moment, which are pretty popular on NFTs and that. I just wanted to quickly go back in terms of the, the funny scams. Mm -hmm. the, the best one I know of is one that was called Ponzi Coin. And I, I love Ponzi Coin because Ponzi Coin, you know, was an out and out scam. You what? read the white paper, the white paper said, you know, this is a scam. If you, if you send us money for your tokens, we will let you decide what color Lamborghini we are going to buy. So, it, and the thing that was lovely about this was it was openly a scam. It said it was a scam. Um, and then at the end of it, they raised about $50,000, which shows people just throw stuff like this. They then returned the money to the people. And they said, actually, this was just an experiment to see how stupid some people are. <laughs> so then we've got a, a lovely example of something that claimed to be a scam that was a scam that actually wasn't a scam. <laughs> Brilliant. I love it. I mean, it kind of is, you know, it does what it says on the tin. If you're calling yourself Ponzi, that's amazing. I, didn't, I hadn't heard about one. I love it, Gary. Thank you. Oh, um, Isabel has asked another question. Um, an uh, interesting point here. What's What can we learn from the GameStop fiasco? Now, of course, that's shares. Where, you know, it's a different thing from um, crypto. But at the same time, um, th this was something that, that happened on Reddit, really. So it's a, it's a social, I wouldn't say a social media scam exactly, but it, it kind of shows how social media can hype things up. Do you, do you have a view on that, Boaz? Yeah, there's all manner of things that you can take away, I think, from GameStop uh, or the Capital Riot, as some would call it. Right. Uh, I, think, I think some of the narratives on it are kind of incorrect. So GameStop... Uh, was this was put forward? The narrative behind it was this was kind of a grassroots rebellion against short sellers. Mm -hmm. Interesting to see how uh, the public mood on short selling can just change so much. So the Big Short, which is one of the most successful finance movies ever, about uh, Lehman Brothers, about uh, you know lots of uh, mortgage fraud, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, mm -hmm. It lionized short sellers with you know uh, you had. Brad Pitt, you had all these A-star celebrity actors in it, and this made short sellers look like, you know, they're, they're the policemen of financial markets. These are the guys, these are the unsung heroes. Mm -hmm. And so quickly, uh, Melvin Capital uh, gets called the, you know, this is, these are the bad guys. These are the, these are the manipulators holding the little man down. Mm -hmm. And that was how it was presented. Uh, I think... I think the fact that uh, GameStop was always was shown as, okay, this is people using Robin Hood uh, on Reddit. Uh, I'm not sure that's actually entirely what took place. Certainly a lot of that did happen. But what were, in terms of what was behind the price action, uh, uh, there were you know, very sophisticated short sellers out there who were looking at the, tr the order book and seeing orders for huge quantities of GameStop shares uh, taking place at the time. And so I think there was, uh, well, you know, the narrative behind it was, oh, it's the, the Wall Street Bets guys on Reddit doing this. I think there are some people who looked at Wall Street Bets and like, this is going to be a good excuse for me to join in on the short squeeze and destroy Melvin Capital's hedge fund. And so you got a lot of money going to the space that wasn't entirely from the, you know, from the every man. It was from uh, other uh, sort of predatory financial institutions that were, were taking advantage of it. And I, that's not a judgment on whether or not that's good or bad. Uh, it's just I don't feel it was entirely presented as Reddit has destroyed this, uh, this, this short seller, the short selling fund, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I think, I think it's, um, more in terms of taking a, a takeaway from GameStop would be, uh, we are starting to see the millennial generation and activist inve investing kind of combined together, uh, with social media like Reddit and express itself in financial markets in quite a volatile fashion. I think we're going to see an awful lot more of that especially as millennials become richer and, uh, you know, and so many of them have this sort of political activism edge to their investing. 
but it, does it also show that it, it's it's like lots of people there's a sort of almost a, a wave of uh, going in one direction and, and I'm guessing how easy it is to be to be taken along by that wave and think oh everybody's investing everybody's saying this oh I'm going to pile in as well I mean that's that's kind of a bit of a worry to me what do you think Boaz? Yeah yeah I'd agree with that entirely uh, you should never be swept along with FOMO uh, and you don't want to follow the crowd so being a uh, being able to keep your head and not getting lured into it because you see lots of activity on social media or if uh, all of your friends are talking about it, that's generally not a very good sign. So by the time that everybody is chatting about it, most of the money's probably been made. Uh, though that's not always the case, there are exceptions. Uh, yeah. But, you know, keep your head. Be, be contrarian. This is always, you know, one of my big things. Be contrarian. And, and speaking of being contrarian, um, Gary, what, what do you feel, what, what's your sense of the crypto market as it is at the moment? Because I'm, I'm hearing you know, lots of people going, oh, Bitcoin's down. And I keep thinking, that's a buy opportunity. What, what's your feeling of the, the situation at the moment? So, so Bitcoin at the moment, so we take a look at the markets, is trading at just under $38,000. And apologies for using dollars, but that's just the, the default we tend to use in this space. Uh, so that means it, if you're a pessimist, it has dropped down from its peak of about $62,000. So a significant drop. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a realist, um, it started last year at... $21,000, I think it was, mm -hmm. which means currently it's only up 50% in a year, <laughs> yes. you know, which, which for crypto is probably not very good, in fairness. Yeah. But if you go and, well, and take a look at your IC, your pension fund, your deposit accounts, that's probably quite attractive mm -hmm. in, in terms of return. So, so to me, you know, okay, I, I don't know if it's going to go up, down, or sideways. That's why I don't offer uh, investment advice or anything. But I do know that over the past eight or nine years that I've been interested in this space, if you hold on to any cryptocurrency for more than four years, mm. certainly Bitcoin proves this true, um, then it, it, you end up ahead. Yeah. Now, that, that, that might change over time, but it does mean that you need to be calm. Don't buy into the fear and panic. Mo most people who lose in the crypto space do so because they probably put in more money than they should have. Mm -hmm. uh, they get very nervous. They see the prices go down and they sell. You've yeah. not lost anything until you sell. So if you hold it and you hold it and you hold it, you've not lost in it until you've sold. And what I have seen is people have sold and then the price has rebounded. Yes. And they've gone, oh, no, I've missed that. And they buy in and they buy in and it drops and they've sold and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's, it's interesting times. I keep hearing predictions about where Bitcoin is going. I think if, if we think of it in the grand scheme of things at the moment, the entire crypto market is valued, uh, I think it's $1.8 trillion, mm -hmm. which, which sounds like quite a big number. In terms of financial markets and traditional currencies and that, that's peanuts right now. Yeah. So it means it's got a massive upside potential to keep growing. Mm. So, you know, I, I'm quietly, cautiously optimistic, but then it's a little bit like, um, I describe it like the gold rush of California in the early 1900s, that the people who made lots of money in the gold rush weren't the people who were looking for gold. They were the people who were providing the ancillary services, you know, the, the rooms, the railroads and everything like that which is why I focus on the blockchain layer rather than the froth that's going on above it. Interesting. Yeah, good point. Um, got a question from Hello Janesh. He says, uh, um, do you think cryptocurrencies are more open to manipulation than other instruments? Uh, Boaz, what do you think about that? Uh, yeah, it's uh, certainly true. That's not to say that there isn't plenty of manipulation that does occur in traditional financial markets. You'll see that Quite regularly, there are very large fines that are levied on certain financial institutions for uh, various you know, suppression or, uh, or boosting of uh, financial assets. So, I mean, there, there is manipulation in, in both. However, do, in terms of the, you know, every, everyone can participate in cryptocurrency, uh, that makes things, uh, you know, a lot easier. A lot of this stuff, as, especially when it comes to decentralized exchanges, you know, it's not like there is a huge amount of oversight. This remains, broadly speaking, very unregulated. And as a result, you do get bad actors, just as you did in the Wild West, who uh, will play games and will, uh, you know, lots of wash trading where they make the volume of certain coins seem a lot bigger when really all they're doing is it's, it's the same person just trading 
uh, one thing back and forth. Uh, yeah, there is the, it, it is more prone to manipulation in that way, uh, as it as there are far less barriers. I'm very much a free market guy, so I don't actually mind that because I think ultimately the market will value things uh, well, or at least better than they would if uh, the government well wasn't intervening and trying to uh, make things the right price. Uh, <laughs> caps on things and whatever so uh yeah it is more prone to manipulation because it it's a free market and you know in a free market where there is very little oversight you will find people trying to uh, you know trying to push things around great and um jonathan robert miller has asked uh, what's your guys opinion on ethereum versus bitcoin gary what are your thoughts there so on a technology level uh, they are different Bitcoin was originally developed to be a means of um, transferring value, so peer-to-peer -peer payments, and it does that very well. Ethereum is a programmatic platform upon which people build things. So from, from a technology point of view, they're, they're actually quite different. In terms of cryptocurrency prices, irrelevant. It, it really is. It, it's like saying, you know, what, how, how do you compare the US dollar to the British pound, but mm -hmm. they've got different backings behind them. They've got different economies, that kind of thing. So, you know, they're just different. Yeah, well, people often sort of talk about them as gold and silver as well. You've got sort of Bitcoin being gold, Ethereum being silver, because Bitcoin is limited like gold. Um, Ethereum's not a bit more like silver, um, and and you know, Bitcoin's that that expensive while Ethereum's down there. So I, I, that, that's sort of something that, that I often talk about. But I mean, generally speaking, I would have thought it's, it's a good idea to have a bit of Bitcoin, a bit of Ethereum and a few of the um, top altcoins, um, you know, the ones that you like the look of. Oh, I've got another one. Um, oh, I also again from, um, now this is Matt, I think. Oh, no, can't see who this is, to be honest. But um, uh, thoughts on, oh, sorry. Um, the, There's uh, the one about the thoughts about banks accepting banks, crypto. Sorry. Yeah, banks stopping payments into crypto. Interestingly, I'm just writing a, an article about that because I think it's very irritating. Yes, what, what are your thoughts? Sorry, what, did, what do you think, Gary, about that? So, so they're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place because yeah. bank, banks have to operate in the traditional financial regulated domain. So that means that they have obligations for know your customer, anti-money laundering, counter-terrorism fraud, proceeds of crimes, uh, FATF transfer, the, the, all, all sorts of stuff. The crypto market, as I mentioned before, at, at the moment is valued at under $2 trillion. Okay, so at the moment, for banks to have to do all this KYC, AML, CTF type stuff incurs quite a high cost to them mm -hmm. for something that's a relatively small market. But if they do it wrong... They risk their license and they risk getting fines. So that they've taken a really simplistic approach mm -hmm. for many of them, which is simply dealing in crypto is too much hassle, too much effort, not enough return. So this is why if you've got a mainstream UK bank account, you'll find it quite difficult at times to link it to uh, a known crypto exchange, shall we say, and I'll, I'll avoid specific names. So that's a complete pain. And it means you end up doing things like having to route via either another country's bank um, or something like PayPal or Revolut or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and you end up building up this trail of transactions that makes it look like you're laundering money. Yes. But in fact, what you're trying to do is precisely the opposite yeah. of complying. So I, I kind of get it. But it would be good... Uh, Matt, Matt Hancock came out with a con uh, comment the other day, Matt Hancock, an MP, who's the ex-minister for digital for, for the government. But let's not talk about where he went from there. But he came out with a comment the other day about how uh, the governments and regulators need to be more crypto-friendly and get on board with this whole thing. Yeah. It'd be nice if that trickled through to the FCA and the FCA became supportive of, of crypto um, instead of writing what are known as dear CEO letters, which they occasionally write to the financial institutes, institutions to remind them of their obligations to do certain things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We need a new framework in some way to help improve things, definitely. 
Yeah, absolutely. And um, Faisal's asked the question, Baz, um, this, this would be for you, because he, we're talking about millennials here particularly. It's, he's uh, pointing out about the increasing uh, environmental concerns about, well, Bitcoin particularly, you know, the, the energy consumption. He's wondering if millennials will actually continue to invest in this way or, they, or are they going to shy away because of the whole um, environmental concerns? What, what do you think about the future with crypto and environmental concerns, Baz? Uh, I uh, I believe the environmental argument that is levied against Bitcoin uh, and cryptocurrencies more generally is actually a very forced argument, and I think it's actually very disingenuous as well. Uh, this mm-hmm. interesting shifting of the goalposts that we you know energy consumption equals bad, therefore high anything that's high energy consumption equal bad. Uh, is very very new. It's not something we've. <laughs> it's not something I've, I've seen levied any time. I mean, I'm fairly young guys. So maybe uh, back in the 80s or something, or maybe the 90s when things were getting a lot more climate aware. This was going on, but you know, I've not heard anyone saying that we need to stop using Christmas lights at Christmas because that uses a huge amount of energy. I don't think the people who you know make these arguments against Bitcoin because it uses a lot of energy don't tumble by which uses enormous amount of energy. So I find it very forced. I think generally from statists who don't like the idea that money is actually moving outside of their control. And so they know that uh, millennials are very uh, open to green agenda and green, green friendly things. I'm like, all right, millennials like that will attack Bitcoin with that stick when actually what they're really interested in is simply constraining the rise of digital money. Yeah, that that is the way it seems to me. I mean, similarly with with banks saying no to pushing money into onto crypto platforms, it seems to me that part of that is, oh, we're a bank, we deal with or fiat currency, we're worried by by crypto, we're, we'll just stop it. I I don't know what what's your feeling, Gary, about the whole environmental issue with particularly Bitcoin. So, so I've seen the various reports. So uh, Cambridge's Judge Business School do a really good report on energy consumption of, of cryptocurrency and that. And I think they worked out that the energy consumption of the Bitcoin network is, I think it's about equivalent to the con- total con- energy consumption of the Netherlands right now. So th- that, on the face of it, sounds massive, um, but is approximately half the energy consumption of energy used by devices on standby in the USA. <laughs> so your, your TV set, when it's on standby, or your dishwasher or tumble machine, whatever, in the USA alone, all of those are consuming more than twice that energy. So it, it's kind of all relative. The other thing as well is that sometimes when you consume energy, that doesn't mean that you've, you know, you're destroying, destroying the environment and that kind of thing, because a lot of crypto mining is done using renewable energy. So there's a lot of things um, like in Iceland and increasingly in Canada, certainly in China and Mongolia, where they're using hydroelectric power or geothermal power. So they're actually using energy that isn't going to waste, you know, type thing. It, it, it wouldn't have been used for something else otherwise. It's actually surplus energy in, in a way. Right. So a little, bit, a little bit like how energy companies, and people don't realize this, but the likes of EDF Energy, um, who will sell you electricity, will also buy that electricity at cheap rates and then use it to pump water uphill in, into a, um, a, a reservoir, which they will then release overnight to generate more electricity that they'll sell at a high price. So they're actually, they, they're actually using that as a way of storing value. In effect, that value is in the pumping the water uphill. Well, actually, crypto is in many ways the same. It is storing the, the consumption of electricity to convert into value. So I, I'm not convinced. And I, I loved it. A few months ago, there was um, a well-known artist whose name I won't share who did a YouTube video saying he wasn't going to do NFTs because of how much energy they burn. Yeah. And he looked at all the lighting in his background rig of his YouTube setup. It's like you're probably burning the equivalent of Switzerland right now, telling me <laughs> you don't want to burn electricity. So I, I think it's a misnomer. <laughs> the other thing that I'll, I'll close with as well, I, I use this a lot when I'm talking about energy consumption in, in crypto, is you look back to when the first powered vehicle was. Mm-hmm. Now, anyone who's seen my YouTube videos or coming onto my channel will know that the first powered vehicle was, I think it was um, 
1763 or 1673, and it was steam powered. It was a steam powered bicycle. We don't see steam powered bicycles now. We went through iterations of evolution. We went from steam to diesel to petrol and, and now electric. And, you know, a, a BMW 3 Series will now do a thing to 150 miles to the gallon. Whereas originally, you know, a, a Daimler or something would do a few miles to the gallon. So there are improvements in the technology. Mm-hmm. So some of the newer NFT optimized blockchains mm-hmm. uh, use much, much less energy. So that, that is certainly changing. It's true, you know, Bitcoin, it's the old gas guzzling, steam burning oil. But over time, that will change. Excellent. Well, just to, we're going to finish. In a, um, can you both give me um, a short um, piece of, of advice for anybody um, looking at uh, buying crypto particularly, and, and especially um, one of the altcoins? What should they look out for, and what, what advice do you have? Boaz, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think the um, if you're interested, you should all. I think you should always learn as much as you can before you do start putting anything serious, any serious money into the game. Uh, that said, and when you do start, always start out with a small amount of money so that you uh, you know what you're doing, understand how to use wallets, understand how to send it send it around. Uh, we've uh, we've we've seen a bit of discussion about Ethereum and Bitcoin right now. I work in the Solana ecosystem, which is a rival to Ethereum rather than a rival to Bitcoin. Uh, and uh, the exchange I work for is called Orca. It's a decentralized exchange. We recently actually published uh, a couple of articles for people who are starting out in the Solana ecosystem. They're interested in decentralized finance. Uh, you can find those if you just go on to uh, the Orca Twitter feed. That's Orca underscore SO. And you shall find links to our Orca for Everyone series, which is all about how to get started and set up an account with a, a regulated exchange like FTX or, or Coinbase. Uh, and how to get it, how to start, a, how to open a wallet, how to then buy some Solana, move it around, and indeed then after that, how to how to start messing around in decentralized finance and uh, doing things like swaps, which are uh, which are one of the uh, great great innovations that we've seen in the decentralized space. So I, I would say uh, to start start with that, if you are interested in Solana uh, and that kind of and that ecosystem more broadly. Brilliant. And Gary, briefly from you, because I'm losing power on my mo- my mobile phone, I realise. <laughs> don't put money in that you can't afford to lose. Yes. Uh, don't borrow money to, to try and do it. Uh, and don't listen to people on social media, particularly not in a uh, number of people in Telegram, WhatsApp and Facebook groups who say, what do you think about this coin? Yeah. You know, just do not do it. Go, go away, as Bo says, you know, go and learn about it. Jo- join a community. You know, check out Books Crypto Club, come and join, come come on to our weekly chats and that kind of thing. Learn, learn what you can, uh, but go and give it a go and have some fun because this is the 21st century now. This is money for the 21st century. Come and join in. Excellent. Thank you. Gary Nuttall. Um, d- Gary is, is a, a Bitcoin and, and blockchain specialist um, and Boaz Shoshan from Orca and also South Bank um, Investments. Fantastic to have you on. Thank you very, very much. Um, and I will, I, I'm recording this and it will be in my Money Magpie newsletter tomorrow. Yeah, no, um, it's this Friday. Yeah, tomorrow. <laughs> It'll be in that. So do go and sign up to the newsletter at moneymagpie.com. Thank you to everybody who's joined. Thank you particularly to, to Boaz and Gary. Um, and hope to see you again at the next um, Instagram live that I do. Thanks so much. Thank you.